So every so often here on the Fanatics Media E-Commerce TV show, we get a chance to talk to somebody who's really been deep in the e-commerce world. And today's guest is gonna be exactly that. Chris McCabe is the founder of E-Commerce Chris. He was spent years at Amazon in fraud prevention and merchant risk investigation. You're gonna to wanna to check out his new digital project and we're gonna talk about that later on in the interview, frustrationfreeamazon.com. But, but it's one of those times where we get the guy who's been inside the machine and we're going to ask him a whole lot of questions. So first, Chris, thank you so much for making time today. We greatly appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. So Glad to be here. Tell us about what you did at Amazon and how you ended up at Amazon. Right. So a lot of people on the outside know it as not so much merchant risk investigation. That's more the internal jargon. Uh, people just generically refer to it as seller performance. Uh, what that meant in a nutshell was examining seller account performance, uh, enforcing policy violations, reviews of accounts, sending warnings, um, you know, obviously preventing fraud if there was bad faith uh, transactional uh, behavior going on, but just covering a lot of ground in terms of making the marketplace safe, protecting buyer experience, uh, taking down, you know, violation listings, that sort of thing. So kind of a mix. And that led you to start your own business, which was e-commerce, Chris. What sure. was the thought process when you said, okay, it's time to go out on my own? Yeah, well, I think a couple of things. It was time to leave Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> I was there for 10 years, which uh, was five more than I planned. You, you got uh, a little tired of the rain? What's that? A little tired of the rain, huh? You know, it wasn't so much the rain, tired of the clouds and the gray and uh, a little bit tired of, of Seattle. Seattle was kind of turning into the behemoth of growth that it is yeah. now, which is all cranes and construction and noise. Uh, it's not really my thing anymore. So I moved back to the Northeast, which is where I'm from. Um, but I also sort of reached the point where I was ready to strike out on my own and uh, do some of the same work, but do it independently and maybe help people in a more kind of positive way, <laughs> reaching out to them uh, from the other side of the fence and helping them kind of navigate the teams I used to work on, which can be extremely difficult, probably more difficult to navigate today than they ever were when I worked there. So. Yeah. And talk a little bit about what e-commerce Chris does. Right. So uh, I began a couple of years ago, uh, mid-2014, I guess, as a client consultant. Um, I'm still consulting clients, of course. Um, in a moment, we can talk about the digital product, uh, digital products that we're working on that will go live soon. Um, I wanted to help people get their accounts reinstated if they were suspended, get their ASINs back if they were restricted from selling those. Uh, I, I mainly wanted to help people communicate with performance and policy teams because obviously from my experience at the company, I know how difficult it can be to read their tea leaves, uh, to sort of deal with their opaque way of communicating. Sometimes it's just non-communicative, um, trying to figure out what they want, what their expectations are, how to give them what they want in a time you know sensitive way so that you can avoid some of the email loop back and forth where you're reading the same messages from them over and over you know, how to cut that timeline, because that ultimately means, you know, getting reinstated sooner, getting getting money from sales sooner. Right. Um, and, and I was getting, as soon as I kind of hung the shingle, I was getting deluged from questions, you know, from sellers who saw, at least on LinkedIn or later on my website, that saw my background and understood that I was accustomed to, you know, looking at seller accounts from the inside with that perspective, the Amazon internal view, uh, with an understanding of how they operate and how they manage their email queues, how they choose to communicate in a in a sort of you know uh, broad general way, which always isn't always the most effective way to communicate with an Amazon merchant. So um, functioning basically as a liaison or a go between between those two sides, I found that sellers were offer uh, sellers and Amazon were often talking past each other. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. And we've had with our clients numerous times where we're hours on the phone with Amazon. You're, you're trying to explain one thing. And you're like, I, I don't understand why you don't understand. You know, right. it's, it's like, it's like we, I, I know we're speaking the same language. And yet I'm saying it's green. You're telling me it's blue and I'm holding it. It's green. Yeah. Um, what, yeah. what have you found has been the most successful thing that you've done to kind of break through um, that miscommunication? Yeah. I mean, a, a lot of it is strengthening people's written communication. I've worked with Many sellers who have a lot of problems being clear and concise, uh, they include a lot of extraneous information. If you have policy violations or, or you're, you're responding to a performance notification that's uh, a policy violation, you're based on an item quality complaint, people are including lots of information about their performance metrics or their 
customer service skills or enhancements. There's a lot of information there that doesn't belong there. Um, they only have a certain amount of time and space to communicate what they need to. And if they're struggling to do that, if it's a muddled message, if they're not the strongest writer at the company, or if they've delegated it down to somebody who's not as familiar with Amazon or how it works, or uh, you know, less uh, experience communicating and corresponding with Amazon performance and policy teams, the message is lost and you don't get to the goal that you're you know, sh uh, shooting for, which is being reinstated if it's your whole account or getting your listing back, you end up chasing your own tail. And you know, if Amazon investigators are given an excuse to pass you up and move on to the next investigation, they will take it every time. They're looking to save uh, seconds or minutes wherever they can. And if you give them that excuse, they will latch onto it and kick it back to you and say, come back when you're ready to you know, communicate with us in an effective manner. Um, they don't always communicate effectively with sellers, of course. So it's happening on both sides. The difference is, you know, where's the pressure coming from and who has the power in that relationship? Well, they do. So it's, you know, it's the onus is on you to communicate and have uh, a strong method of delivering the information they need. If you don't have that, they can always wait until later. You might not be able to wait. Right. What are the yeah. biggest reasons that either people lose their listings or there are ASIM problems that you come across that are the most common? I mean, there's so many now because they're, they're kind of sending warnings for everything under the sun or, or even suspending people for things that they used to warn for, which is sort of the most alarming part I've seen. I don't know if that's their, their lead into the holiday peak, Q4. Uh, I mean, when I was there, we used to send warnings for image quality, image violations, things like that, you know, images that aren't up to the standard of Amazon. Now I see people getting suspended for those kinds of things. So easy, easy mistakes to make are, hey, does the image on the site show the item that you're shipping into FBA or you're shipping to buyers? Right. Um, you know, are you just assuming that even if there's a packaging change, people will understand that, you know, what they bought six months ago is still the same product as what you've just sent them? Um, have you checked the images? Have you checked the just basic, you know, bullets, listing content? Are you uh, making comments and listing condition comments that indicate it's not new, but you're listing it as new? Things like that, that um, I think people took for granted that it's a huge site and uh, they weren't going to be uh, held responsible for every little thing. But I mean, at this point, you could be warned multiple times in a day or even suspended for what used to be considered minor infractions. Like, again, like images, listing content. Are you simply jumping on a, a pre existing listing without really checking to make sure it's 100% matching to what you're getting from your supplier? Um, so that's sort of the listing example I would sure. give. There are other examples that are just as basic, but you know, people are kind of doing margin sales, right? They're buying from suppliers and sometimes they're just not vetting suppliers the way Amazon wants you to, or the way Amazon is now vetting your supplier themselves. Right. Themselves. Yeah. I mean, they're reaching out by email or phone to suppliers. They weren't doing that as much, nearly as much, even four or five weeks ago. So are you doing your due diligence? Are you showing Amazon that you're the kind of seller they want? Or are you the kind of seller that keeps rotating back in for another manual investigation, right. you know, costing them investigation hours, resources? That's not what they want anymore. Anyone who's not as organized, missing things, not double checking things, even things like late shipment rates, right? I mean, that's something that comes in around the holidays, around this time of year. They start really grinding people down if they're above 4% on late shipment. Um, they used to be a bit more forgiving about that. Now they're extremely unforgiving because we're coming to the end of 2016 and the time has sort of come and gone for, you know, you to have a, a letdown with a drop shipper or some sort of technical snafu that results in late shipments. They sort of don't care what the reason is anymore. Right. It's, it's up to you to fix it before it even comes to their attention. Um, you know, once you get into November and you know, peak sales. Uh, I know I'm giving you a long-winded answer. No, this but. is great. <laughs> Look, the one th the one thing we tell everybody who listens is yeah. the people we have on are experts, and they've been through it. Yeah. You know, we're we're not talking to our next door neighbor who had the one time complaint with Seller Central. Right. So, you know, we're, sure. again, we're talking to Chris McCabe, who's a founder of e-commerce. Chris, he spent years at Amazon, so when he talks, we should listen. So please, you know, <laughs> lo long wind away. Yeah, just wave at me if I'm talking too yeah. long. But, uh, <laughs> There are so many things that people are still doing, I guess is what I'm trying to say, that I think they should have stopped doing a year or two ago if they expected to continue selling on Amazon, period, let alone uh, having these interruptions and 
um, in their in their sales because of suspensions or warnings. Uh, yeah, things like late shipment rate, they have this uh, concept of uh, holiday war team, they call it, which is basically like, you know, automated suspensions for right. just missing these targets. Because at certain times of the year, you can't, you know, you can't really afford to make those mistakes and they can't afford to have you making those mistakes because buyers are, you know, uh, too interested in getting their items on time as expected. Right. Um, and whether it's a listing violation or performance metric misses, I mean, at this point, they're extremely unforgiving, no sense of humor. Uh, they, they, it depends on the product, the category, so forth, but most of the time they consider you replaceable. I hate to put it that way, but if they think you're selling something that's not, you know, a hundred percent replaceable, that if, if they think that you are a hundred percent replaceable and they think you're acting like you're not replaceable, then there's a major disconnect that has to be remedied as, as soon as possible. <laughs> well, and we're on a bunch of these FBA seller groups and, you know, Amazon rock stars on Facebook and you hear people complaining about a lot of this stuff and you go, well, you, you could have fixed that, right? That that's on right. you. So you just mentioned a bunch, but, but if you had to pick like the top couple errors that people make that are just so easily avoidable that you want to just kind of reach up, flick their forehead mm -hmm. and go, stop. If you had taken five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, you wouldn't be dealing with any of this. What, what would you advise people to avoid? Yeah. On I mean, front? I'll, I'll retreat back to the supplier vetting example because so I still see a lot of people just taking a deal that's too good to be true and not really examining not a lot of quality control. Right. But uh, I mean, I'm not it's it's different every time. I'm not sure if people are just sort of randomly inspecting a few units when they first start a relationship with a supplier or a distributor and then they sort of assume everything's good to go from there on out. Uh, I, I don't know if they're not doing their due diligence in the beginning, but if something's too good to be true, just like street smarts in life, it is. Right. And you, you know, I mean, the days of sort of we didn't know and, and claiming ignorance and making an apology, those days are over. Uh, you know, ignorance is not an excuse. And Amazon has gotten to the point where they're just not interested in spending the time investigating accounts for people that aren't organized or aren't doing their due diligence. Um, they, they don't want to spend time emailing you about it. They really don't want to have to keep, you know, circling back to review you for it. Uh, if you had a one-time blip two, three years ago, then, then fine, you've corrected it and you don't need to lose sleep over that. But if you had a blip two or three months ago and you're still kind of not sure of the quality of the products you're selling right. from other suppliers or, you know, you're, you're heading into holiday trying to recoup some sales you lost from a suspension earlier this year by getting even better deals and making margins on that. I mean, these are just bad business models for Amazon. They're, they're, they're very harsh for a reason. Um, they've decided that it's, it's a tightening, res more restrictive marketplace. Um, it's a consolidating marketplace as well. It's not as hospitable to smaller sellers. They consider most of the business you're doing with them could be absorbed elsewhere. And that's how they, you know, their perspective is what counts here. Um, it's unfortunately their view or the highway. So their way or the highway. So that's one. Um, the other uh, mistake people keep making is thinking that they can kind of grab a bunch of invoices that are overly redacted or missing information or are impossible to read. Sometimes I see ones that aren't in English or they've got dates from two or three years ago or maybe even last year because they buy annually. You know, the, the concept of the, you know, we're going to buy once a year liquidations, closeouts and show something documenting a lot sale or some pallet we bought somewhere. I mean, I can't emphasize this enough. I mean, that's that's in the past. And, you know, whether you can make substantial changes to your inventory sourcing for Q4 and holiday peak right now, you know, almost October 1st or not um, is one thing. But in general, you have to gravitate off of that business model because Amazon's decided their product quality teams, their item quality investigations are all geared around how many item quality complaints do you get? If you get them for, if you get complaints for inauthentic items, right. what kind of documentation do you have? Can you show us letters from suppliers on their company letterhead that lay out supply chain documentation? Or are you just giving us an invoice for a distributor who we can't find any information on anywhere in the internet? <laughs> right. Because because they have no established presence selling those items. I mean. If it's an authorized reseller that appears on the manufacturer or brand website, then terrific. If Amazon's just ignoring that and you have to keep writing them emails, 
drown them in documentation, proving that these are legitimate, authentic items. If you don't have any of those things, then you're kind of over to the side in the maybe pile, which is maybe they want you back, maybe they don't. Um, and you know, people sometimes just lose individual listings over bad documentation, bad invoices, uh, you know, an inability to verify a supplier that you're sourcing from online. What if you lose your whole account? What are you going to show them in terms of verifiable links or emails to the sales director, the VP, whatever it is at the company? Um, if you're like hooked on the on the gray market experience, um, you might not be able to get a supplier letter on their company letterhead. You might not be able to get supply documentation, supply chain documentation Amazon wants. What's their incentive to reinstate you if you can't provide those things? Right. Well, you know, it's interesting, though. A couple of things you said are some of the things that I think drive some of us sellers so nuts. Right. So we were representing a brand that makes their own. It's a food product. And I know grocery is always going to be tougher, but it was a food product that they made literally and they shipped. And we're trying to get the brand page and we're trying to get the category approval. And they said, well, we need, you know, an invoice from somebody who purchased from you. So we sent them Whole Foods and they said, no, we need an invoice from one of your suppliers. So we mm -hmm. sent them the people who sent all the brown rice and all the, you know, the, 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 the bran and the oats. And yeah. they said, no, it has to be, you know, another kind of supplier. And, and so we sent them the people who sent all the chocolate chips. Right. And they said, no, that still doesn't qualify. I said, well, you, you, you've got the retailer. You've, you've got yeah. the supplier. We own the website, which is tied into the email we signed up with. Here's, yeah. you know, our business, you know, forms. I, what else do we do? And we finally, yeah. after four weeks, got, you know, approved. But it was such a process that, that to me made no sense. Well, let me ask you a question. Yes. Uh, at what point in those four weeks did you start escalating beyond those product quality teams that kept asking for the same information over and over? Because often an escalation is the only real way to get this done in a timely fashion. Within the first week, week and a half, we just kept trying to escalate. Uh, okay. And eventually we got there and some people, you know, we even had people who were helping us say, this is ridiculous. All right. of your paperwork is here. I'm staring at it. Sounds and yet like I need somebody else to sign off on it. Right. Now, escalating what you mean within seller support or this was written communication with seller performance product quality team? Uh, we did both. We started with calls to seller support and, and asked for yeah. category approval and, and you know, yeah. category changes, and then went to written. And look, it eventually all got worked out. But I do know that right. a lot of people get frustrated with this process. And I know we oh, can't sure. be the only ones. No, that's a common experience. People, people who contact me after the fact, I guess, commonly um, refer to a three, four, five week time frame to get listings back, lifting, lifting, listing restrictions, getting their ASINs back. Sometimes people are, I think part of what you said, you know, people are, are wasting a certain amount of time with seller support. Seller support uh, doesn't have a direct, uh, you know, red phone, blue phone to policy teams to talk to them and talk about your account. Um, I've seen a lot of incorrect information given out by seller support because they feel they need to say something. Right. They can't just say, I don't know, over and over. Um, and I've read some cases. I don't spend a lot of time reading cases anymore because there's a lot of bad information in there just as there is in the, uh, in the seller forums, right? And on some Facebook groups. Um, you need to communicate in writing. I mean, a lot of people are hooked on this idea of I, I need to call Amazon. I need to be on the phone. And or if I get something in written from seller support, it's documented in a case and I can use that written proof. But a lot of times there's incorrect information in that proof. And if you go to like seller performance or product quality and say, hey, I was told by seller support X, Y, Z, they don't care. They disregard it. They don't consider that good information uh, to begin with. They want you to communicate directly with them and they can't communicate by phone. So a lot of sellers have to learn. I mean, I'm not talking about technical issues or, you know, um, somebody changes async contributions on a listing and you need to change it back by, you know, showing manufacturer website information. Somebody loads a bad image. I'm not talking about things like that, right? And occasionally, seller support will look in your account and will almost read account annotations to you, which they're not really supposed to do, but sometimes they will do that. One out of 100 times, one out of 250 times, that can be worth your time. Um, if it, when it comes to the teams I used to work on performance and policy teams, 99 times out of a hundred, whatever seller support tells you is either wrong or it's nothing you can use mm. in communications with those teams. I hate to say that, but, uh, I know that's discouraging, but that is the case. I've seen bad information in seller support case responses more often than I've seen good information. 
Well, yeah. the, the man knows what he's talking about. We're talking with Chris McCabe. <laughs> he was at Amazon for years. Uh, he went out on his own. He formed ecommercechris.com, which if you are having any problems uh, with your Amazon listing, if you've been delisted, if you're having issues, just check them out. But I want to talk about, Chris, your new digital project. Yeah. You're coming out, um, and it, you can, people, you can go to the website now, frustrationfreeamazon.com. What is this, this, this business? And, and tell us a little about what you're doing with it. Right. So kind of quick background on it. Um, I and a fellow consultant uh, named Leah McHugh, we've spent a lot of time this year taking what I'm doing in client consultations, individual one on one work that I'm doing with people, making it accessible to people that don't necessarily you know, retain me as a you know, month in month out uh, consultant on their account. Um, taking a lot of the information that helps people establish the proper method for communicating, as I was saying, with performance and policy teams. Uh, in this particular, in our first product, we're focused on uh, appeal process. How do you get an account back that's been reinstated? I'm sorry, how do you get an account reinstated that's been suspended? How do you get an ASIN back that's been suspended or restricted in some way? Um, doing it faster, doing it more cleanly. How to uh, create a plan of action that actually makes sense, that they'll actually read. Right. Um, uh, you know, communicating the fact of, you know, Amazon's internal operations are very, uh, kind of streamlined at this point. They do these investigations quickly. They need to review your information within a few minutes at most, probably. Sometimes they're really just skimming or scanning what you send. So you have to make sure it's not too long. It doesn't have the wrong information in it. Um, so we kind of process all of this into one product that will be accessible at frustrationfreeamazon.com. Um, and it's a program that we're going to be adding to over the months, especially heading into peak holiday here. Uh, and, and there will be other iterations of it, but the first product will be the general plan of action approach. How do you write an appeal? What do you include? What do you exclude? Um, and how do you find the information, most importantly, that goes into the appeal, whether it's in you, you know failures on your operational side or in your seller central account? And what type of seller uh, is that kind of, you're the wheelhouse for? Right. What size? What variety? Where, where, where should people say, OK, this is what I do. I could really use frustration for Amazon dot com. Yeah. I mean, size could be any any size, any seller who needs to change either their business model or their approach to dealing with both Amazon and even maybe their their Amazon customers, if you want to think of it that way. Um, if you provide any kind of bad buyer experience. You can't really negotiate or debate with Amazon whether or not you're providing one or not. They're using buyer complaints against your account, buyer reports of problem orders. They're using that as their yardstick. So uh, sometimes Amazon's just telling you, hey, we think there's, an, there's a problem. And you might think it's an appearance of a problem, but it's really on the buyer side of the fence. It's not so much what you're doing. If they've told you that they think it's your problem, then it is your problem. And it is a real problem. Uh, and it needs to be addressed as such. Um, if it involves mentally, you know, changing your kind of internal brain gear to uh, think of it in terms of an improvement plan and not so much a defending myself plan, well, fine. Think of it as all the improvements you can put into place to ensure the smooth, efficient running of your Amazon account, um, whether or not it's a one-off, whether or not you've had a couple of complaints from buyers that maybe were only you know, 50% true and 50% hazy. Right. Amazon thinks you have an item quality problem. Most of the suspensions we deal with are item quality driven and are, are uh, sent by policy teams that think uh, there's something wrong with the quality of your inventory somewhere, whether it's a item condition complaint, but you've listed the items as new, uh, whether or not they think you've got a bad supplier who needs to be replaced, or you simply need to deactivate those listings and move on and not sell those items anymore. Um, they need a plan, a fully fledged plan from you that establishes what went wrong, what the root causes of those mistakes or errors were, and then lays out all the solutions, all the proactive solutions you put into place, which will prevent future complaints and future problems, because that also means they won't have to spend time reviewing your account anymore. And uh, just to, as a sidebar, they've had a lot of trouble scaling the work. Um, a lot of people sending in emails or appeals that, or plans of action that immediately show that they don't address the root causes of the problems or those proactive solutions. They toss them to the side and ask you for another one because it's an easy investigation for them. It's an easy excuse for them to move on to another seller. They've got tons of emails to read. They've got tons of sellers they're suspending. Um, a lot of sellers are still active who are losing lots of their ASIN uh, 
uh, all of their listings for, for other reasons, right? Maybe not item quality. Maybe they don't have uh, the legal right to list those items. There seems to be an increase of infringement claims going in. So ultimately, think of it from their perspective. Are you costing them time that they could be spending on other projects? Are you writing in a, in a way, are you using your best writer even to communicate those ideas well? Um, you know, does your plan have the right content? So we're kind of working to get these digital products, you know, uh, full of as many tips, suggestions, and as much guidance as possible that so, so that people can kind of do it themselves and identify their own path to reinstatement based on their own specific circumstances, you know, their own shortcomings, and also tailoring it towards uh, the kinds of communication Amazon wants to see from them. What Chris is saying is you have a really, really crappy product of low quality. You should just go it off Amazon. Now, uh, so, so again, we're talking to Chris stop McCabe. Listing it. Right, stop yeah. listing it. Uh, we're yeah. talking to Chris McCabe. You're going to want to check out both ecommercechris.com and you want to check out his new digital product, frustrationfreeamazon.com. Now, Chris, before you kind of you know, got into your own business, you did a lot with fraud prevention. Yeah. What are the biggest issues, and not just on Amazon, but, but e-commerce overall, what are the biggest issues on the fraud side that people should be, and sellers and, and, and small businesses should be concerned about? Right. And, and I should probably emphasize that in terms of fraud prevention and tools, there's only so much I can talk about. For sure. Um, I saw a lot of sellers that were not, uh, I guess, I still see a lot of sellers um, that are not technically savvy, uh, that were falling for easy prey phishing schemes and clicking links they had no business clicking, um, that, that were giving up their password way too easily. And I worked a lot on account compromises and I had to spend a certain percentage um, without getting into specifics, a certain percentage of every day, uh, sanitizing accounts, prompting people to reset their passwords, sometimes canceling order, you know, bad orders that were um, buyers looking at that, looking to buy something off of that seller, which had nothing to do with what they were really selling. Those were the fraudsters right. uh, products up for sale. Um, and the fraudsters were trying to fly under the radar and reap the benefits of those sales before um, Amazon could stop those bad orders from being processed. So it was a mess from Amazon's perspective. Buyers had orders canceled when they were buying too good to be true, you know, um, plasma TVs for a couple hundred bucks. And um, it was just, it, they had their orders canceled. They had to go back and order something else. Um, and it was all because sellers had a very frail concept of the kinds of information that Amazon will ever even ask you for. Um, and the kinds of information you should ever provide when you're clicking a link and, and going and putting your password in. Um, you know, do things in Seller Central. Don't do things because you think an e emails from Amazon right. and think a link is valid. And it looks, it sure looks like Amazon's website, but it's actually, you know, something that a fraudster came up with. Um, so kind of up, up your IQ in, in the technical savvy, uh, e-commerce savvy department. Yeah, we got one last week. It was uh, from a, a domain at Amazon dot right. customer response dot like, you know, yeah. knowing better dot net. Right. And it was like, don't, don't, don't click me dot com. Right. It might as yeah. well have said, hey, if you're a schmuck, you're going to want to click right here. Yeah. And that goes actually for a lot of people. Um, I, just to rotate back to a point I made a few minutes ago about knowing your seller, you know, going into Seller Central and knowing what's where and knowing where to find return reasons, uh, looking closely at even things like negative feedback, the nature of those comments. A lot of product quality investigators are looking at the wording of return reasons, the wording of the A to Z claim against you, and using that as a basis of, hey, do they have a lot of not as described or not as advertised items? Maybe there are more here than we saw in this one complaint that we got from this one buyer of this one order. And that's, you know, they're investigators, they're trained to dig deeper. And if you've got some of this stuff in Seller Central sitting there, you haven't addressed it, you don't even know it's there. Um, you're delegating it down to people who are sort of, you know, lower level employees or people who aren't as familiar with Amazon. You know, that's a problem. You need to be as, uh, you, you need to get your hands dirty with Seller Central. You need to know where things are. Um, and a lot of times I ask people, have you looked at ABC? And what's their first response to me? You know, where do I find that in Seller Central? So some of that's kind of the, you know, educate yourself, get up to speed, um, even, you know, to be a bit harsh about it, remove some of your ignorance about how Amazon works 
and don't assume that you can solve everything through seller support. You know, be be savvy about this stuff. Yeah, no, that, that's that's really good advice. Do does Amazon weigh when you're getting a, you know return reason or a complaint who it's coming from? So, for example, I, I'm a Prime member with hundreds of purchases a year. I might complain about one. Right. <laughs> Whereas somebody who might buy three things a year and complains about two, is yeah. there a comparison where you say, well, that guy buys 100 things a year. He complains about one. It's probably a problem with the product. Whereas this customer may be the problem itself. It's a huge. OK, so this is a huge problem. Um, and this is one reason why you've seen an uptick in enforcement around things like gating and brand approval lately, the last four weeks. Uh, trying to kind of stop sellers before they even get in the room so that they, I mean, don't, they're being proactive instead of reactive. In the past, they were letting everyone in the room and then bouncing people out who were behaving badly, right? Think of it as a, as a bar and, and a bouncer at a bar, right? Instead of letting everyone in and then picking out the bad players, now they want to get you at the door before you ever make it inside. Well, why is that? Because they, in the past, have not seen enough success, quite frankly, with the approach of we are going to use buyers as product experts, and we're going to use them to vet the quality of your inventory because we don't have the incentive or, or the manpower to go into FBA randomly selected units of yours and check them out and make sure they're what you're listing. No, we're going to wait and see what buyers complain about in terms of the quality of the items you're listing is new um, or how they match what you've listed on the site, the product detail page. Is it truly matching what people are getting? Um, Unfortunately, they chose that path for the last couple of years, and we've seen the results. We've seen a lot of good sellers being punished for things they weren't doing. Um, a lot of people getting warnings for, you know, what came down to commingled inventory, uh, warnings for fake or counterfeit, and it wasn't even their item, right? It was in theory, it was their the right. same item as what they were sending in FBA, but it wasn't actually the same quality. Um, so that's been the big problem. Are they really looking at buyers as product experts? Do they understand how much buyers understand the item that they're looking at, um, or are buyers complaining for for other reasons? Uh, unfortunately, this is hard to scale work, and it's not easy for Amazon. It's not easy for for any company to do this type of stuff. But uh, given the millions of sellers and the millions of listings, they had to choose a path, and unfortunately, they chose a path that involves accepting or assuming that most buyer complaints are valid. Well, we just have one more question for Chris, and, and, and I want to thank you so much for your time. We're talking with Chris McCabe. Check out his site, FrustrationFreeAmazon.com, and if you have any other issues, you can go directly to him at eCommerce Chris. But we right. always ask before we let any of our guests go, what are your three tips? And you could give me two, you can give me four, but, but your yeah. best tips to have the most success on Amazon. Um, learn, okay, so let's start with learn policies instead of guessing at what they are or um, going on seller forums and just posting something and asking them what they're, have an in-house compliance expert in terms of Amazon policies, whether it's you, whether it's somebody you hire, um, it doesn't have to be a former Amazonian like me, but find somebody who's got that same knowledge in their head or learns it, because if you're stabbing in the dark, you're going to run afoul of the rules at some point or another. And at, by the same token, you know, don't look for loopholes to exploit just to get an edge on your fellow you know, sellers. I mean, loopholes can be closed. If you're hooked on operating a certain way and tomorrow they you know, post a policy revision and you're not with it and you're either not aware of it or you're still doing things the same old way because that's how you're used to beating up the competition, you're, going to, you're risking the entire account you know, because you're sort of falling behind the, the policy curve. So A, learn the policies and B, plan on following them. <laughs> Um, and, and C, don't ask, you know, seller per, or ask seller performance perhaps, but don't ask seller forums and assume that the answers are hundred percent gold, just like with seller support, you know, don't rely on that. Um, and, and leading into a second point, I guess, is make sure that if you're talking to these sort of gurus and experts, when it comes to Amazon, the, the marketplace seems to be full of them, you know, know your stuff and do your due diligence and find out people's backgrounds. It does again, it doesn't have to be necessarily a former Amazonian like me. That would probably help. Um, but understand who you're talking to and what their background is. Um, I've wasted a lot of time, unfortunately, correcting a lot of bad information people get from people who never set foot inside an Amazon building or have never been to Seattle. Right. <laughs> or or just generally, you know, all joking aside, just don't know what they're talking about. 
Um, make sure you grill them before you pay them any money or have them review your plan of action. Make sure they understand what's expected on the inside of those Amazon walls, not just what they think is, ex is expected based on this blog post or, you know, that webinar. There's, there's a glut of this stuff in the marketplace and, uh, just, you know, do your due diligence, make sure experts are really experts, um, maybe quiz them on policies that you're aware of, that you've confirmed um, are the 100% updated policies, make sure they're up to date. And, uh, you know, also just, like I said, make sure they understand who the people are on the other side of the fence, who's reading your appeal. Um, do they understand what that is? Or do they understand what an SLA is? What email cues are? Do they understand the basic building blocks of how your appeals are processed? Or are they sort of pretending like they know this stuff? So, Well, uh, what a great answer and a very, what very... Are tips? Do you want anything else? Yeah, but I mean, I mean, keep it rolling. We're not going to stop you. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, a lot of things, I, this is a big topic, but just in general, in a lot of ways, things are trending towards private label, right? They're making it harder to piggyback on listings. I've seen people who are warned or suspended for an image they never even loaded, right? They just happen to be listing against somebody else's non-compliant listing. All of a sudden their notifications are filling up with warnings for listings that they never created and images they never loaded. So that's a big deal, right? You don't want to get a notice claim of infringement because you're on a listing and the rights owner just happened to mention you as the infringing uh, party um, when you're not even the one who created it. There's no reason to take a fall for somebody else's mistake. So things are kind of heading in the direction of private label. Understand how to do private label responsibly. Um, understand how to write emails to Amazon. You brought up the example of Amazon tuned you out, right? They weren't looking at your invoices. They were sending you the same generic messaging right. over and over. Understand where to send escalation emails. Understand what an escalation looks like. Um, if you've got a suspended account and you're trying to escalate it, Make sure you escalate with a really good plan of action, not just because you feel like it or you think you're not being heard and you need to go straight to Jeff Bezos. That's not really how it works. Bezos escalations are you know, an email to Jeff along with an attached plan of action that actually solidly addresses the original problems with your account. It's, a, it's kind of a multifaceted approach. Understand what that approach is. Um, things like that, you know. ASIN variations, don't take a child ASIN and treat it like a parent and create a bunch of variations off it. Uh, know what these things mean, don't just sort of guess and you know, finding workarounds. A lot of people say, what's a workaround for this? And they describe to me what they're doing and it's a policy violation. <laughs> don't do that. You, you're just gonna wander into a, 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 a dark forbidding landscape and you'll find a lot of trouble, you know, you'll have a lot of trouble finding your way out of it because you'll have to communicate your way out of it and it won't be easy to do. So, Well, Chris, I, I want to yeah. thank you for your time. I also want to invite you back after the new year when we've heard about all the problems everybody had at Christmas season and the right. holidays and Black Friday and Cyber Monday because I think that, that we're just going to have the pile up of them. We're going to have about 9,000 more questions to throw your way uh, yeah. and, and I think you'll be excellent at it. So, Chris, uh, Chris McCabe from FrustrationFreeAmazon.com and EcommerceChris.com. Check them both out. Uh, I, I'm going to watch this interview five or six times because there was so much in it. Not that I want our view counts going up any more than they already do, but, but I would yeah. advise you watch it at least twice uh, and comment below. But this was uh, very, very informative, and, and I'm quite uh, glad we had you on and appreciative of your time, Chris. Yes, constructive criticism is always welcome. Provide me any feedback. Uh, I'm curious to hear um, some, some feedback on what we've talked about today especially. Yeah, Thanks for having me. It was our pleasure.